sorry, you cut me <clears throat> eating a cookie. Um, anyways, um, so I wanted to kind of cover kind of the getting us towards the end of the Cold War. And some of this has to do with um, Nixon and kind of the 1970s economic malaise. Um, the big thing that I think you need to be aware of is that, you know, Nixon is somebody who, I mean, he's, he's complicated, right? He'd been on the House and American Activities Committee. Um, he, you know, Eisenhower embraces him as a vice presidential candidate in part because he represents the, the farther right side of the Republican spectrum, kind of not quite McCarthy, but in McCarthy's neighborhood, right? Um, and so he was a hardcore anti-communist. Um, and so that's kind of his position within Eisenhower's administration. Now, he was never particularly well liked by Eisenhower. Um, which is part of why Nixon's very paranoid. Um, and, you know, but Nixon is also very much a pragmatist. I mean, he is somebody that understands how business gets done. Um, and you see him coming in in 1968 and he wins that election. Um, we do know now that he kind of helped scuttle the peace talks in 1968. Um, but, you know, cause he knew that the Vietnam situation was, was helping him gain some people. Um, so you have him doing some of that, but ultimately, you know, you also see him continuing the funding for NASA. You see him, you know, really tweaking some of these great society programs. He doesn't do away with them. He does shift control over to the States and that has its own problems, right? Because when you turn over control to States, sometimes some States, don't always see equality in the same way that other states do. Um, so there is a criticism there, but he doesn't kill off the programs, right? Um, he embraces the Environmental Protection Agency. He creates the Environmental Protection Agency. So the Endangered Species Act, this awareness of the environment that really begins in the 1960s with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring just continues into the 1970s. And you see him embracing the Environmental Protection Agency and environmental restrictions and restrictions on water quality and, you know, signing the Title IX uh, education acts that guarantee women have equal access and equal opportunity in education. Um, so Nixon's complicated. He's not all terrible, right? Um, he does have some unfortunate tendencies to kind of appeal to law and order, um, which means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Usually it appeals to our baser instincts. When you say, I'm a law and order president, I'm going to keep those people from getting out of line. That's going to mean whatever you want it to mean. So if those people to me look a certain way, then he's automatically appealing to that. So this is one of the kind of the ugly sides of Nixon, kind of makes it a little bit difficult. He's also very critical of the Supreme Court. Um, this is a Supreme Court that had argued for Brown v. Board and Miranda v. Arizona and, uh, you know, Tinker v. Des Moines. And he's very much going to, you know, say, I'm going to put conservative justices on the Supreme Court. So you see him doing that. Um, now, the big thing is, in regards to kind of global conflicts, is that he's really the president that kind of begins to disengage the United States. Not only does he try to work a way to get us out of Vietnam, and, and we can critique that in a bunch of different ways, but you cannot deny the fact that his intent, whether we want to talk about effectiveness or you know ethics, that's a whole different conversation, and you can look at that a couple of different ways. But if you're talking about his intent, his intent was to get us out of Vietnam. And you see him realizing that one of the ways to do that was to reach out to China. Um, and so he reaches out to China, begins to normalize relations with China. You have the ping pong team, Henry Kissinger. Um, and so part of what's going to happen with Vietnam has everything to do with him normalizing relations with China. Um, that adds pressure to North Vietnam to come to terms um, because China is going to say, hey, look, we, you know, we've got a big trading partner. We don't want to upset them. Um, you see him reaching out to the Soviet Union, creating what's called detente, which is this easing of tension. Um, and you have a nuclear arms reduction treaty, uh, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty 1, there's SALT 2, that kind of eases the tensions that are going on there. Um, so Nixon is a big part of kind of pulling us out. And one of the great ironies 
is that only Nixon could do that. Only Nixon would be the person that would not be accused of being soft on communism because he had been so harshly anti-communist for so long. Um, but because of that, he is able to kind of get us disengaged. Now, again, it's into all of this that you have Watergate. We'll go into Watergate in more detail uh, as we get into politics. Just know that he does, there's a break in, there's a cover up and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that does help bring down his presidency, even in the midst of what could arguably be seen as some positives between the easing of tensions and all that sort of thing. Now, the United States, there's some other complicating factors um, which we'll talk about with, with the Middle East. Um, and just know that, that the strategic arms limitation treaties kind of continue really, uh, you kind of have that detente simmering throughout the 1970s uh, until Reagan becomes president in 1980. Now, when Reagan comes in, he's a harsh anti-communist too. Uh, he believes in peace through strength. In other words, we're going to build up our military. Our military is going to be more powerful. Um, he says the, the Soviets aren't following the SALT treaties. We can throw those out. He talks about the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, um, as a way of kind of putting these missiles in space and shooting down the missiles. Um, this is going to be the answer to kind of resolving the tensions with the Soviet Union. Um, so he talks a lot about that. And all of this begins to ramp up the pressure on the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union economically is not strong enough. And think back with the Cold War to the beginning in like 1946, when you had was the long telegram that came out that said that this, the communist system was inherently weak. Well, it was, and it just took a lot longer for it to come out. And so what's going to happen is that Reagan's kind of ramping up. It's going to put so much pressure on the Soviet Union. Now, keep in mind, the Soviet Union has invaded Afghanistan during this period. So they've made some bad decisions, but fundamentally their economy can't withstand all of this. And so this will help bring about the collapse first with the Berlin Wall and East Germany, uh, then the rest of Eastern Europe, and then eventually with the Ukraine and Crimea breaking off from Russia and all this kind of stuff. And so um, that's kind of how you end up with a Russia that we have today, a Russia that's going to have Vladimir Putin. Um, and he comes to, he kind of rises to power in the mid 90s, um, you know, following Yeltsin. Um, so that's a whole nother side story. Um, so that's kind of how you get to the end of the Cold War. I did want to touch a little bit on kind of the social groups because the social groups are a big part of this. We talked about the beat movements, right, of the 1950s. We talked about kind of globalized culture. Um, you have a number of counterculture groups, a lot of them coming out because of a combination of civil rights and a combination of anti-war. Um, Students for Democratic Society very anti-war, but they didn't necessarily have to be only anti-war. They were all about kind of democratic government, democratic regimes, and really kind of challenging the United States government um, from being too nationalist. Um, so, and, and so that, you know, this SDS is kind of problematic. Hippies and counterculture become a big part of this. Um, you know, now you could be a hippie and, and be anti-war, but you just because you were anti-war didn't mean you were a hippie. Um, it's into this. You have the women's movement happening, National Organization for Women, uh, Gloria Steinem, not, not Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan's uh, Feminist Mystique, uh, and then Gloria Steinem and the National Organization for Women. They, they kind of emerge starting to challenge all of that. Um, and you have affirmative action. Uh, LULAC, the United Farm Workers Union, Cesar Chavez, the American Indian Movement, a lot of different groups begin to emerge during this period, as well as the environmental movement and the consumer movement. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that a little bit, simply because these different groups are part of why Nixon is able to convince a lot of people that they're part of the silent majority, um, that they really do are okay with what the president's doing. Um, and so even when you get to Reagan, part of Reagan's appeal with this anti-communism is we don't want to go back to the protests and the frustrations of the 1960s. So there's going to be a lot of kind of resentment of all those different protests movement. Um, and yes, yeah, some of that is anti-war, some of that civil rights, which we haven't quite delved into yet. Um, but what you'll see is that all of this is kind of happening together about at the same time. Um, and when you have the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and then the Soviet Union collapse in 1991, that's where you really kind of see um, 
that's where you see the end of the Cold War happening. So the 1990s will usher in a different period of global situations um, that have a lot more to do with kind of uh, putting out fires of terrorism, uh, as well as dealing with the Middle East.